Hello and welcome to another episode of the Viva Bastardo Show, vacation edition, as you can see, uh, brought to you by the Haggerty Podcast Network. Today, I'm delighted to bring to you Tom Gale, who is the head of design at Chrysler from the late 70s until, I think, uh, early 2000s. He designed the Plymouth, Plymouth Prowler, the Dodge Viper, the Lamborghini Diablo in the early 90s. We have an amazingly interesting conversation about the minivan, oddly enough, that revolutionized minivans in the, in the early 80s. Uh, so let's get into it. Tom, uh, first of all, thank you again um, for, for coming onto the show. Um, as I said in our sort of rambling preamble, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of what you've done. Um, I think both uh, in a way artistically, but also um, in the context of the automotive industry and what you did with Chrysler, sort of, and oddly enough, I mean, I know that I'm sure that people always want to talk to you about um, the Prowler and the Viper and all these kind of mag magnificent things that you, you helped make. But also I'm kind of interested in the K car because that sort of set the ground, I think, for the beginning of Chrysler's turnaround. I mean, what, what would you, what, what would you say to that? Well, that's uh that's an interesting question, and, and it's a good one, by the way. Uh, the uh, thank, thank God. <laughs> the uh, the when I started in the late '60s, you know, the Chrysler was you know had been in and out of trouble and always in and out of trouble, but uh, the K car uh, didn't happen until 1981 and was started in the late '70s after. Hal, Hal Spurlock came over from Ford as president, and and Hal was really uh, an incredible man. I mean, he was a great product planner, uh, probably doesn't get enough credit for all the things he did, but he he was an architect of K-Car as well as minivan and Mustang at Ford and a lot of other things, and, and just a great boss. And, uh, and, of course, in the early days, I was lower in the organization, but <clears throat> somehow things caught hold. And, and, uh, so the K car really was the, the basis for a lot of what came later. Lee came over in 79 and, uh, brought with him a lot of uh, people that he felt confident with, uh, from Ford and they were all we, quite senior. Yeah, go ahead. Before we get further into the weeds, it might actually be worthwhile just explaining to everyone who you are. <laughs> Oh. And what you've done <laughs> before oh. we get before we get into all the minutia, because I think that that will give everyone a lot of context for what we're about to talk about. Well, I should have asked you. that at the beginning. It's my fault. I'm sorry. No, not a problem. Uh, I'm Tom Gale. Uh, I'm a designer by trade, but have worked in uh, so many areas. I started out in engineering at Chrysler, but before that, I worked at GM uh, Summers as an intern and. Worked in the factories and worked everywhere. Grew up in Flint, uh, home of Buick and Chevy. And my father and grandfather were uh, with Buick, so I was kind of an outcast when I went to Chrysler. But uh, it, it was just wonderful to me, and my career was basically at Chrysler. And I'm primarily known for design, but uh, I started out in engineering because I always figured I could move from engineering to design, but probably never the reverse. And that was really beneficial. Would you not be Would you not be taken seriously if you were a designer who then became an engineer? Probably not. Uh, but later on, I was responsible for all of engineering and design and all product development before I retired. But but uh, I think what happens when you start out young you you make a lot of good friendships and you have people you count on and you can always kind of uh, dial up people and say. You know, here's what I'm hearing, but uh, what's the real story? How do you feel? And uh, those those are lifelong relationships, and there's a certain trust, and and so, and that works both up and down in organizations like big organizations. And so, I was, I was just very fortunate. So you came onto Chrysler, uh, so in the very early '80s, is that right, or late '70s? I, I came in, actually in '67. Uh, oh, and I started, I spent four years in engineering. I didn't move to design until 71 and started out on the board and, and uh, worked my way up. So how does, how does one make a transition um, from engineering to design? Do you have to 
do you have to and, and i can only relate this i i did a similarly sneaky thing re, it, centuries ago when i used to work in advertising i worked as a i got into advertising and i always wanted to be on the creative side but i i didn't have a portfolio so i sort of got the door as some sort of low-level minion and i put together a portfolio and, and sort of weasel my way onto the creative side by putting together a portfolio and showing the people this is what i can do so is there a similar process in in from going from engineering to automotive you have to sort of show your design chops or how did that work for you well uh I, I did. You have to have a portfolio for sure in design. And uh, I I did have a portfolio coming out of grad school. And, but uh, uh, I had an offer to go to GM and an offer to go to Chrysler in design. But there was this alternate offer to go to advanced engineering. And that that's back to kind of where I started. So I I just figured I could go there. But I work in advanced engineering. I work very closely with design. And so you had several years to build a reputation. You had several years to be a supporter, to really understand what they, what design was looking for. And that didn't go unnoticed by a couple of executives there who really later became my mentors and, and brought me to design and, and without ever seeing a portfolio, but I had one. Uh, so that was, I, I think, to answer your question, that's probably the most specific way of getting there. And then, and then were there all the? I mean, there are so many. Now, you, correct me if I'm wrong, because I've been, I've been, I've been stalking you on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of things in the '90s that that everyone will reckon, and early 2000s that you had a hand in. Of course, the Viper. And let me just tell you, I remember I was living in Paris at the time, and I went to the Paris Motor Show to see the Viper specifically. And it was just a frenzy. I mean, I'm sure from you know, I'm sure you, you're well aware of the, of the madness that, that that design created or caused. Um, then what was it, I think uh, the thing that that I think that um, amazes me the most is the Prowler, just because it's it for me. Um, it, it, it's almost it's almost madness that design for a major manufacturer to have created something like that. And and also incredibly romantic and audacious at the same time. And I have such, and I'm, I'm, it would be, I mean, <laughs> I sort of long for the day. It would be so glorious to see a major manufacturer make, make something that courageous these days. Were you, was this, was the Prowler in particular something that you'd sort of, I know that you, I've read that you've been, you're into, very into hot rods and all that kind of stuff. And, and I always thought that hot rods were kind of like jazz. They're like this American art form. Was, was that something from the from your youth that you always kind of wished you could make and and somehow hoped you would? Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, hot rods really are kind of a counterculture thing, and they were always initially with a bad boy image. But coming back to how we got started, there it was really uh, we had such. I, I was had the good fortune of working with so many talented people. I mean, I get credit for things that that you know there's so many it takes so many people to to do things but but uh the prowler came about with con we are always looking for concepts and so we we're always looking for concept cars and different ideas to try out and uh prowler came about in the pacifica studio we had a studio out in carlsbad california and and some wonderfully talented people but one in particular kevin Ferdoon. And uh, we were doing just off the wall sketches. We would just fill the board with uh, ideas for future concept cars. And we would do, I tried to do one for every brand every year. Because, you know, at the time when we first started doing that, I mean, we basically were known for K cars. There wasn't a lot of excitement on the show stand. And, and uh, not that they weren't great, but, uh, but uh, the concept cars really got us rolling. And it showed that you know, we as a design staff weren't brain dead too. And so uh, I'd always been in, interested in hot rods. And I think Kevin and Tom Tremont and the crew knew that. And I was building a personal hot rod at the same time too. But uh, the idea, the sketches for uh, hot rod were ongoing, for Prowler were ongoing. Didn't know it was Prowler at the time. And, uh, and so we built the car. And I really never thought, like Viper, that that would be one of those concepts that could come to life. And uh, to put all this in the proper context, we were changing the organization at the time at Chrysler 
to become platform oriented and far more cross functional. And uh, we didn't have a lot of engineering research. Chrysler was always just all hands to the pump. Uh, big companies like, you know, Daimler and Mercedes and GM and others had research organizations. And we didn't. So as a consequence, we didn't know a lot about aluminum, aluminum forming, extruding, joining, welding, uh, what have you. And, and so Prowler, my interest in having Prowler come to life was really, that was in a way of having applied research. It still fit with having a separate small team, which is what we were trying to move the organization to. Uh, so all of those things kind of came together. In reality, uh, Prowler probably shouldn't have happened. You know, it should have had a V8. It should have had a lot of things. And but uh, the learnings from being able to do it, and more importantly, inside the organization, it became kind of a, a bellwether. Everybody was cheerleading Viper to be successful. Everybody was cheerleading Prowler team to be successful. And those are really important inside the organization because it gave everybody kind of a purpose and courage. So I, I, the Prowler was more significant than what its true marketability would show. Did that... Did that give you lessons going forward in terms of manufacturing and design the the prowler in particular or, or? uh I'm, I'm i'm sorry i missed the did, 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 did making the prowler teach you guys lessons in terms of manufacturing design like did it teach you the un, un, to the understanding new techniques or work, work as you were saying working with aluminum that kind of stuff was that useful in the context of the prowler oh yes because at the time we were just you did you know it was kind of rare to see a vehicle with an aluminum hood or aluminum hood in or an outer, uh, learning how to uh, stamp it and have the dies and have be able to hem flange it or be able to join those pieces was just just kind of starting. I mean, the Europeans were starting some of it, but but uh, yes, it was very much a learning process. And we used a lot of outside suppliers to gain that knowledge uh, through the people that that did those parts for Prowler. But I. Th- what would have been your ideal prowler specifications, Tom? If well, you, had, yeah. if you, <laughs> as a yeah. hot rod man, if you'd had your druthers, what would it have been? Well, I can. My hot rod has a supercharged V eight and uh, independent front and rear. But uh, for prowler, it would have had a V eight. It was just, you know, everybody looks at prowler and say, "Well, gee, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that?" But packaging. And really meeting all the requirements of crash, meeting the requirements for bumpers, meeting the requirements for all those things, and still having a design that uh, reminisced those those hot rods uh, of the 50s and 60s, uh, so to speak, uh, is a really difficult task. And so we designed the bumpers so they could be removed, as you can see with the way the design is. Uh, uh, The overhang, the the front end, the front end would have been uh, even longer with having another set of cylinders out in front of where we were so that and and probably a little bit of belt and suspenders on the part of the engineers uh you know the prowler ended up being a, a v6 and still very powerful still an interesting car but but uh, yeah i would have had a v8 and a manual transmission <laughs> <laughs> and i thought that i mean every i saw on oddly enough I, I live in new york and i saw on the other day and i was just Amazed. Uh, it, it's it's such an extraordinary idea, uh, and it's it's almost like um, I I would imagine, and and I, I have, and I'm correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure I am, but I would imagine that making extraordinary cars is, is kind of like making extraordinary movies. It's so hard to do, and there are so many people involved. But when a when an amazing car does emerge, it's sort of almost a miracle in some way. You know, it truly is, and and that's where. Uh... The concept cars, that's where having the ability within within an organization to separate some people out of the herd and, and give them a, a, a very unique and definite charge it creates an awful lot of energy. And uh, uh, that's true in any large organization. It's true even in the art world, in my opinion. And, and uh, so I, I think, you know, it was just a great time. We had a management organization that sponsored it. Uh, They let us do things. Uh, The rest of the organization was very supportive. You know, for all the concept cars we did, and we did some 50 of them, uh, when you look back on that whole library of things, you know, there are things like the Atlantic, which 
uh, reminisced uh, late 30s. But we've got the Atlantique, right, with that yeah. teardrop uh, window. Yeah, so I, I, mean, I mean, I have to say, Tom, it was. I was looking back. It, it's funny because I was, I was, I guess, in my uh, 20s and very early 20s in 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 the 90s. But I remember being aware of just how of kind of the repeated barrage of extraordinary Chrysler concept cars that you guys are churning out. And then when I started looking looking back at it, I mean, I mean, so do you say you mentioned the number 50? Yes. Yeah. That, over the course, that was over the course of 10 years. That was from, basically, I took over design as, as uh, head in 85, and we started in about 87. And, uh, and then that ran until I left in 2000, end of 2000. Uh, and and the organization continued doing some after, but that was kind of the heyday was the nineties, uh, late uh, late eighties and through the nineties. Late eighties were kind well, of that. That was the thing that that's what I went to car shows for. I went to car shows to see the concept cars. I wasn't really interested in production vehicles, and I would imagine as a as a car designer, that must have been utter joy to be able to flex your imagination in a way that you couldn't do on a, on a sort of daily basis. Maybe. Oh, just, uh, unbelievable. Uh, I, I was, uh, was so fortunate, uh, to work uh, with great people either, uh, beneath you in the organization or people above you and around you. Uh, it was just a great time. And, and, uh, we had a, uh, wonderful group of people that, that, would work and a lot of very talented people. Like I said earlier, a lot of people think, you know, gee, you know, Tom did all this stuff. You know, you you have to uh, kind of set the stage and be the leader and 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 certainly you're part of what the selection process does and you're also part of leading that to get there. But, but uh, so many good people that just deserve a lot of credit. Um, so, Talk to me a little bit about, about the, the, the Viper, if you could, because again, it was um, it was just <laughs> I, I, that's one of my, one of my most visceral kind of car memories of my youth is seeing is going to the Paris Motor Show and seeing this red monster just just you know just on the stand and, and and I had to I remember having to fight my way through the crowd to get to the front so I could see it because it was just mob it was, it was like Elvis was there. Uh, that was how uh, we knew, you know, we had something. I mean, we did the car in the late 80s. Uh, you know, the play model was done in primarily in 1988, early 1988. But we had been what, working on it. Um, what, what, what was the, did, was it just, was this just sort of a, a styling exercise, a, a thing amongst you and your teams? Go, okay, let's see what we can do. Can we make like a, I know that you'd mentioned somewhere that it was like a contemporary Shelby. Was it oh Cobra? Like was it was it sort of just a, a a whim in a way, or was there an idea that maybe it could become a production thing? I don't know that when we started we thought it could become a production. I think we always hoped it would, and uh, you know a lot of credit goes to Bob Lutz. He uh, he had just uh, had an Autocraft Cobra made, you know, by Brian Anglis in England, and and uh, uh, so he was enamored with the idea, and he kept you know, nudging me and we would always kind of uh, cheer each other on or we'd be in meetings. Yeah. And you're, Did you, you know, need that much nudging, Tom? <laughs> uh, no, probably not. Uh, we, uh, the concept car thing took a life of, took on a life of its own. And so we were always looking for ideas. And so this became a perfect way. We had been noodling. We knew Bob was interested. And so uh, Neil Walling and the crew in the studio, we had put together a board where we had packaged a V10 uh, in a uh, Cobra-like package. And, uh, I mean, there was no doubt that we were, you know, our eye was on the imagery of, of a Cobra, no doubt. Because yeah, I don't think there was a much better icon of the 60s than than that car, you know. and uh, not, not for kind of, not for a just raw, unadulterated, um, no-frills race car muscle. That's it. Absolutely. That Absolutely. And then it's history with Carol and everything. And, and, uh, and of course Lee was, uh, uh, you know, a pal of Carol's and Carol worked in the organization. He was a good friend and we knew him. And, and so, uh, 
we had to keep Carol in check too, because, you know, he wouldn't have done the Viper that way. He wanted a smaller car, a V8, lighter weight. You know, I mean, he was just a racer at heart. And, and so it was uh, uh, fascinating how we kind of kept him in the fold. I actually built another I Viper. Bring him Because isn't he a sort of a force of, na- wasn't he a force of nature? Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, he's pals with the chairman. So how do you handle that? <laughs> that's, a, that's a delicate line to, to thread. Yeah. Well, Carol became a good friend, but uh, uh, <laughs> I actually built another Viper. You, If you looked at it, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but it was about seven, eight size, had a V8, uh, slightly different in some of the ways. But And we built that in the closet at Pacifica. And I would bring him out there to say, you know, look, we're looking at this too. This has a V8. And, uh, and, uh, and so it was, uh, it was just fascinating. Why, why, why the decision to go V10 versus V8? Was it, was that, was that maximum Lutz's push? Oh yeah. Yeah. Bob was, uh, but see, we were doing the truck V10 at the time. And this was a great way to celebrate that. Uh, You know, of course, at the time we didn't know, it's going to become a production vehicle, but I think in the back of most of our minds, you know, if we were successful with this, well, what, like you said, when it hit the stand, uh, Phil, uh, people were just, just deep all around the car. And uh, even though there were some outrageous things like the original kind of floating windshield with the mirrors and that snake wetting of pipes in the, in the gill there and everything, uh, you know, those are things we knew we wouldn't do for production, but, but, uh, the car itself, uh, that first car, we actually, uh, hammered out of steel out on the West coast. I mean, it was, uh, it was a car that, you know, it was a concept car that we wanted to make sure it moved and it could come on the show stand. So people would look at it and they would see it not just as a fiberglass model with a plywood bottom, you know? And so, yeah, it, it, I think we all had a feeling that this could happen. And uh, Bob certainly, I mean, he was just a force. And and with all the concepts cars, coming back to your point, uh, you know, he was very much a champion for what we were doing, very supportive of, I mean, you almost couldn't have a crazy enough idea. And uh, and so, you know, we were sitting like that. Pardon? It's always good to have a boss like that. Oh, yeah. I remember I, I remember when I when I worked in advertising, this guy I found very inspirational I worked for had said to me, listen, I want you to show me ideas that are number 11. I can always turn you down, but it's very hard to turn people up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of lessons in, in management, especially creative management. And, uh, and so I, I give him a lot of credit. I mean, I think we had to really reach. And so that's where, you know, I can remember sitting in meetings with the Japanese and because we were tied with Mitsubishi at the time, we're sitting there and the meeting's going on and the translation and, you know, you'd make like a three second answer and somebody's translating for 20 minutes. And so Bob would be sketching. And so, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, he was sketching things like Fagoni and Falashi, uh, uh, Bugattis and stuff. And, and I saved some of those, but I would never show the studio guys, the literal thing. I would always describe it to them with words and ask them to start sketching so that... Oh, in terms of like the thing that Bob would... Something that Bob would want. So, oh, interesting. So would you never leave them imaginations un, 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 unfettered, basically. Absolutely. I, I think when you walk in with the sketch as a leader or the boss gives you a sketch or whatever, all of a sudden, everybody stands back and say, oh, well, he's got the idea, let him do it. You know, and so I think you really need to... to uh, in leading a creative organization, I really think you have to draw out what people are sitting there thinking. And a lot of times the next generation beneath you comes up with things you never would have thought of. And uh, it's just magic. Uh, it's just so entertaining. And I just love that process. And and uh, that was really the spirit that got most of those 50 crazy things uh, going. You know, we'd go back and celebrate stuff that Exner did in his time as leader of design. We'd go back and celebrate. If somebody else had a good idea, we'd celebrate that just like the Cobra. So, I mean, it was, and then once you've done the concept, you kind of own it. You kind of create your own turf. And so that was part of the the philosophy. What were some of the um, 
particular I loved was that um was it the 300 uh yeah. concept oh yeah. i love how that looks man that is just a fan that is a i mean the the, the atlant the atlantique the you could clearly see the bugatti kind of atlantique references on that teardrop but the 300 for me there's something about the proportions of that car that are yeah. just glorious oh, well thank you uh, the uh the atlantic was uh was kind of a contemporary caricature of late thirties things, but the 300 that you reference was a Viper platform. It had the V10 as well, but then it was all pulled out in this glorious proportion because the sports car kept it low. And uh, the inspiration for that car was the Monteverdi high speed, which you're familiar with. I am very and, familiar. A friend of mine, I, yeah. I, I love that car. It's a fantastic car. Absolutely. And so that's why, the driver's cockpit was dark color, and then the rest of the interior was light. and And uh, I just love the design of the three hundred. It almost had sort of an Oscar uh, grill on the front. Oh, you're right. uh, yeah, you're right. it, it was it's kind of grill. Still our signature, yeah. but again, this is this is just what I was talking about. With you know, if you need something, you borrow it, and uh, and so it was, uh, and it became yeah. ours. <laughs> About, you know what's interesting, Tom, and what you say because for me, I'm all for I'm all for borrowing ideas. But I think that it, the, the the mark of real genius for me is when the idea emerges from your mind, and it's and you and you've changed it. So it's you, you can't really see the original idea in what you've produced. Because when you mention the Oscar, I go, oh yeah, that is kind of an Oscar-like grill. But it never occurred to me when I was looking at the car, yeah. and that to me is that's real originality. Yeah, I agree. I, we used to. Like if I wasn't quite getting what I wanted in one studio or what have you, I'd I would start up another model in another studio, and uh, I would say, look, uh, you know, we're not competing with what's going on there. But I said, take what we've done over here, and here's what I've got over here. But I want you to take what I've got over here. I'll give you all the surface. I'll give you everything you need. But but I want you to now take this, and we're then going to put the two of them together and see what we can see what we can glean from this. And uh, that process, Phil, uh, uh, really is magic because what you do is you're building on uh, what someone already has and you're creating a lot of sponsorship. And so now the person that did the original one, I said, go look at what they're doing. Look at how good that is. And, and all of a sudden they're back. Wow, I'm going to take this and go. And so uh, it it really does work. And, and like, the 300 taking a few of those bits or whatever, they're not so literal that anybody really uh, says, well, wow, this is plagiarizing or this is copying or whatever. And, and to my mind, as long as you can take something and move it to next step, then I think it does exactly what you're saying. I think it becomes a, an item of its own. Right. It's seamless. It's a seamless evolution. Yeah. Now, is it true? I think you had a hand also. Well, you had a hand in all sorts of things, Tom. But um, uh, the Diablo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I'm not mistaken, that's a, that was originally a Gandini design. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So how did you... Now, I mean, look, I mean, there's so many car designers who I, I regard as, as, as you know, unsung heroes. Gandini is not an unsung hero. Oh, uh, yeah. How was that sort of... Putting your hands, putting your hands on one of the master's designs, was that intimidating or not really? Well, uh, I mean, it's always, I mean, it's always uh, intimidating. But, but uh, Lee Iacocca was, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a sponsor of mine. We were friends, and and I worked in the organization not directly, but below him, and uh, we had just purchased Lamborghini, and so. Uh, of course, Lamborghini was like, yeah, okay, uh, just send money. We'll take care of the rest, you know? And, uh, <laughs> right. and, uh, and so it was, but Lee never, I mean, that's just not the kind of guy he was. And, and I think we probably had it because this was a great excuse for him to get to Italy. He had a, a villa in Italy. And, but, uh, the first review and Lee used to bring me along, you know, whether it was back in the days of De Tommaso or, or uh, uh, after the purchase of Lamborghini in, in 86 or 86 or seven, I don't remember which, but anyway, he would bring me along. And so we were having a design review in San Agata and uh, uh, 
the Lamborghini guys, you know, obviously Gandini, uh, an amazing talent. I, this is in no way disrespectful to Gandini because, you know, anybody that does stuff that's pure beauty like Mira and some other things and Kuntash, uh, you know, it's, he's rightfully earned his place. But uh, the first meetings, it, we just weren't getting what we were looking for. You know, I mean, and Lamborghini, he's like their what, guy. What were, you, what, were you, what were you looking for? Well, I mean, you're looking for successor to Kuntash. And uh, this was codenamed P132 Inside. And the car that was there, in defense of Gandini, I honestly think he was being led by Lamborghini Engineering. And there was one particular, I'll leave a name out, but was a particularly strong, uh, you know, and I could just imagine the discussion with him and Gandini was, you know, here's what I want, not necessarily what Gandini wants. And, and you know, that wasn't going to work with us. And, and, uh, and so we had an, that first review and not real happy. And so we had asked for some things to happen. And, and, uh, and so the next review is at Lee's Villa in Tuscany. And uh, so Lee and I are there and, and we, again, they roll out the car that, that uh, Mr. Gandini had done. And, and uh, good grief. It just wasn't, I mean, nothing had really changed in. And so and except that time had gone by, and so finally, I said to Lee, I said, look, I'm going to pack all this stuff up. I'm going to take it back to Detroit, and we're going to do the car. And uh, and so we did. And so now, you know, I'm right there. He comes in for, you know, a review. I used to run a monthly review with product design committee, and he was – I wanted him as the chair of it because that gave me the right to make the make, build the minutes. Uh, but at any rate uh, – uh, we brought the car back and and uh, and then I knew if I just sent back drawings or whatever, Lamborghini engineering would change it. So I I sent over one of my guys, Bill Dayton, with the car and and uh, and we built the tooling model right in uh, Detroit, sent a fiberglass model back and said, you know, this is it. And so that's how the car came about. And it, it's quite different. The front end is still very much like the original Gandini car, if you look at front view, but the rest of the car is all different. And uh, and I think it was a, a way of celebrating. Uh, I mean, I see Countach in the car, you know, in the is certainly in proportion, certainly in the way it's there, but the surface is all uh, very much loved. And and uh, uh, and don't forget, we were doing this at the same time we were doing Viper. This was 88. Uh, we were building the Viper concept in uh, 88 and uh, it debuted in. Uh, Detroit Auto Show of 89 and and we sent the tooling model over uh I think it was maybe a little bit later March of 1990 but they were all being done about the same time I mean to be doing both of those cars concurrently yeah it was uh just uh, an amazing testament to the kind of talent you had and of course at the time we've got nothing on the road really that that demonstrates what we do and so or what we could do and so those concept cars became a way to uh signal to the populace that we weren't brain dead uh i remember you mentioned in europe we we brought the the 96 viper coupe over i i was running a design but also a president of chrysler international at the time and so we were uh, introducing viper in europe the coupe in europe in 1996 and and uh uh the and so we brought phil hill and brian redman over and and we did a tour of the famous tracks we did spa in belgium we uh did the old track rams uh in france uh, around the track tom yeah well what was left of the track in some instances and then finished up at nurburgring and so we're out there and there's 30 crazy journalists driving these cars which is a dangerous situation anyway and uh and so they're out there going and, and, you know, I'm going around the track as fast as I feel comfortable. And you don't want to be the one that wraps up a car, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, so Brian Rebin says, come on, Tom, I'll take you around. And so, so he jumps in the car and off we go. And, and Brian is driving and, and he's shifting and looking at me and, and driving and we're like 165 miles an hour. It's like, man, shouldn't you be watching the road? And it's like, you're coming over blind corners and it's like, it's like, 
how do you know which way this is going to go? You know, but I mean, he's just done it for years and that's, he's, he knows that track like the back of his hand. But, and so I had both of my, my palms were on my knees. And when I got out of the car, I had two wet spots on my knees. <laughs> where, so. I, 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 I'm not much of a, I've always loved cars and I've, and I've been fortunate enough to own a bunch of pretty interesting and unusual cars, but I've never been much of a speed merchant. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a particularly good driver, and I'm yeah. sure I would. I'm sure I would have soaked through my entire the whole thing, and, it, and everything I was wearing would have been drenched. I'm sure. Well, it takes a special talent to do that, and I don't. I certainly don't have it. You know, I'm, I'd be much better with a pencil and a drawing pad. Uh, and we leave that to people that can really do it. Tell me a little bit about. My, I have my memories of Lee. Uh, I have memories of Lee Iacocca as a kid because I remember my father. I grew up in England, obviously. My dad was American. Um, and he was, he, I remember he read Lee Iacocca's autobiography. And then I remember, of course, seeing um, the ads that Lee would make on TV. I think he was one of the first, was he not the first president or guy who ran the company to actually do, I think he was the first guy to do that, right? I, to, I, to make I, ads on TV talking about his cars. I mean, there, were, there were probably others, Phil, but I think he was the first one that really became uh, an icon uh at at doing that uh i mean in fairness to perhaps others who may have been out there but lee was good at it and um lee was just an amazing guy a good uh, uh, person i regard as a friend but an amazing boss too but he was the type of leader that when we would have the top 100 of the company come together for you know the kind of update on what's going on and a pep talk and what have you uh I always used to say, you know, you didn't need doors to get out of the room because the people were going to walk through the walls. And uh, Lee was just that kind of guy. And and he would always have a book that had the script in it, but you would never know it. And because uh, uh, he was what, just a script, for, a script in terms of what he was going to say at the meeting. Yes. For the speech, you know, what have you. Uh, but he was just so good and his mannerisms. Uh, were so good. And, you know, and he, everybody would look at him and you would think, well, gee, he's just a really outgoing and gregarious guy. And uh, to some extent he might've been or was, but, but for the most part, he could stand long silence, you know, like we might be having dinner somewhere if we were traveling and you're having dinner in Italy or whatever. And, and there could be long periods of silence, you know, and you just kind of had to know that. You know? And so it was, uh, and it was always interesting. And you always, I always felt a bit like a fly on the wall. You know, it was just really great. One of the things I was reading about him um, was when he came over from, uh, uh, was it GM? Or, uh, Ford, Ford, Ford. Ford. Ford, sorry, Ford. That's yeah. right. When he came over from Ford, oh, yeah, that's right. He brought, he, he, he brought not only a bunch of people, but a bunch of ideas with him. Um, I think in particular, the minivan that Henry Ford II, I think, had been vociferously against. Uh, and I, I imagine, were you involved in any of those ideas he brought with him? Yeah, I, I was uh, uh, in the, you know, in the late seventies. Lee came over. My recollection was like in seventy nine, uh, yeah, maybe even late seventy eight. But Hal Spurlock had come over before Lee. Uh, he came over, I think, in like seventy eight. And Hal was really one of the prime architects of of minivan and uh it took lee getting there to get it going but but uh uh we had had some concepts going that were like minivan but when hal got there and he saw uh what could be unique by having a front wheel drive everybody else was doing their minivans on a truck platform so they were much you know much different package and what you know it didn't have the efficiencies that front wheel drive could bring to the the back half of the vehicle. package do you mean you mean the use of space inside all that kind of thing? yes it, well the location of mechanical components and sorry yeah the package would be the I'm kind of the basic translated for civil i'm <laughs> translating for civilian stuff <laughs> yeah yeah no that's uh i should have known but uh but at any rate uh hal had kind of uh got all this going and and this is not to diminish any credit for Lee in any way, but but Hal was really the guy. And of course, you know, I worked for Hal, and and uh, we had uh, 
I, at the time I was running interior studio and we did the interior on the, the first minivan. And so the whole thing was, uh, was done to really kind of break through the mold. The other guys were doing it is an evolution of what they were doing with truck things. And this was not intended to be a truck. This is in, in a way it comes back to our earlier conversation on the concept cars. If, if you put together a group that's going to do something unique and different, that product usually will end up being somewhat that way. And, and that was the case. That was why, you know, both GM and Ford went, stayed with uh, rear wheel drive architecture and they were really, I mean, they might've been successful, but they were really never successful. Like, the Chrysler minivan where we had over 50 share. The, the, uh, well, and yeah, it was a, it was a huge success, but, but what was the impetus behind it? Like, was it a, a sort of a, a result of a focus group um, uh, and a sort of focus grouping and, and uh, wh- wh- why, I guess, what was the, what was the why for the minivan? Other than, I mean, I understand the packaging in the front wheel architect was radically different, but what was the reason for it? Well, this is where, that? yeah, I do. Well, I mean, this was back to, uh really uh hal and and uh, lee uh you know the marketing guys at the time uh you know i'll do credit but they thought we could sell twenty five thousand minivans i mean they really clearly weren't on board and both lee and hal are standing there saying look i'm gonna bet my life on this and uh and so uh Did they give and, a- and, and they were right pardon but did they explain why they would bet their life? And I'm just so curious about, because that was truly quite, a, that was a really revolutionary idea and, a, and, a, and a, a revolution execution, even though now, you know, a minivan is, seems like the most mundane of things. But back in the <laughs> early 80s, it was a radical idea. And yeah. so I'm just curious as to like how something that, what was the, like, why? I just, I'm always curious to know about the, the seed of a revolutionary thought. Well, I think... I mean, I, you know, when you look at the way uh, uh, customers were responding at the time, I mean, you could tell there was a need for something new. I mean, we'd had enough wood grain sided station wagons that were built from passenger cars. And then if you looked around the world, uh, you know, you, things like Renault Espace and, and uh, uh, you know, which was a very functional, uh, logical uh, evolution of of packaging and design. Uh, it's an amazing piece of design, the Espace. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I think all of us in the, you know, kind of in the car world, I mean, the car type, car guy type people, I mean, you just kind of knew. I mean, I, you just always have a certain sixth sense and a feel for what's going to work and what's not going to work. And certainly uh Hal had all the confidence in the world and Lee had all the confidence in the world. And of course with that duo, uh there was just no stopping it. So uh it it was just amazing, amazing time because that became, you know, that like the K car really became the profit machine. You know, the margins on those, because you could sell them like crazy, the margins on those pretty soon there was a second factory. And that really provided all of the the bread and butter to pay off the loan guarantees to pay off all those things when, and I, I was Seven fortunate enough, ahead of time, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was part of the, the crew that I was like the product guy and we would send a finance guy and a product guy out and we would do the, to the world. And we were shopping, selling shares the first time we had trouble putting down the shares at, at $9 a share. And two years later, we sold the whole book at $39 a share. So, I mean, it was uh, an amazing time. I think we should explain this was, this was initially when Chrysler was trying to dig itself out of its financial troubles, right? Yes. And then, yes. And then you guys went, uh, didn't Lee go to Congress and ask for some sort of loan of some kind? In the, the, the loan guarantees came earlier. They came in okay. like 80 or 81. And by 83, they were paid off. Uh, okay. And so those first initial... Uh, stock offerings and you know and the shares you know were almost worthless you know at, at one point but it's so interesting to think that the, these things that seem so mundane in retrospect like a minivan although that was revolutionary or the k-cars paved the way really the 80s paved the way for this extraordinary period of creativity in the 90s absolutely absolutely now, that was the the genesis for what came later and the 90s, you referenced this at the beginning, but 
the nineties were a particularly prolific time. I mean, when, you know, we had the success of the minivans, uh, we were looking for a way we needed a different icon to do things like Ram truck and try to break through because any normal, uh, share for us, I mean, we were really doing good if we had a 7% share of the pickup truck market. Well, we're looking for a way to kind of have Ram breakthrough. And so the, the initial design of the 90, the Ram that debuted in 94 kind of aspired to a Kenworth, you know, it had a, uh, you know, kind of a, over the road truck commercial, field commercial to look at. truck yeah 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 like a big rig basically and in later years our show share went from seven to you know in the 20s you know i mean in in our business in the auto industry those kind of volumes and those kind of margin and profit it's huge and uh, uh and so you know that was going we were redoing but hang on, so uh, to go back to the ram truck for a second tom it's actually again it's one of those things where when you've lived with a design for so long you forget the radical inception um so that was quite a departure to sort of say okay we rather look like a pickup truck pickup trucks for the most part look more or less the same from like in the 80s and early 90s right they had yeah. they had very they were sort of like in large sedans in some way the front fascia if i'm if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, because you're obviously the expert, but then your guys' inspiration saying, okay, we're going to look like a big rig. Uh, we sort of, it was like hyper masculine. It was sort of, it was pre, it was envisioning you guys were ahead of the curve in a way of become, of creating this super hyper masculine look. I think, I think like you, you just see on trucks now. I mean, they just look so sort of. I think you put your finger on the one thing that I always, felt you know before i took over design and and when you look at product evolution uh we were always we as chrysler were always uh reactionary you know we were like if you looked at the product from just purely through design eyes for so to speak we were like two years later you know when you look at the the roadrunner and those cars that came out in 68 it was really echoing a little bit of what GM and Bill Mitchell did in the 60s, 66. Uh, and th that just kind of continued along. And, and when you got to things like the trucks that you, we were just talking about, everybody's truck looked like everybody else's truck. And, and, you know, okay, there were differences. I mean, the expert would look at it and say, yeah, okay, that's a Ford or a GM, but, but, uh, ours just basically kind of followed along with them. And, and as a result, our market share, you couldn't afford to refresh very often. You couldn't afford to do the things that you needed to do. And so you needed to have a way of being uh, proactive and not being reactionary. And, and the Ram was a, just a great lesson in my mind of being able to do that. And then once you had that design, that kind of became yours. And that flowed through all of the subsequent uh, vehicles where we refreshed it. And, uh, and so then the next thing, what do you look for the next time? Well, I'm going to do the first club cab with four doors like a crew cab would have, but it's still the package of, you know, kind of a cab and a half or cab and three quarters. And those were instant hits. And so that it becomes, I've always called it meaningful differentiation, you know, where somebody can look at it. They might not be able to verbalize it, but they know that something is there that's, that's intrinsic. It's not just superficial. It is interesting that the, 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 the gravitational pull of inertia is so strong, particularly in the context of design. Yes. So when when me as a regular civilian, I see a big company doing something radical, it's just it's or, or just I mean, actually, oddly enough, and I'd be interested to know what you, your take on this. Um, talking about contemporary manufacturers, I'm looking at Hyundai and thinking, God, they're doing so, in the electric car segment. I think, God, yeah. they're doing something really interesting. Well, what's your are there, uh, can you can you be uh, it, as diplomatic as you can be? Are there people now who manufacturers now cars that strike your interest now that that you think are being audacious in the way maybe not as in the way that you were being, but are definitely catching your eye? Is there anything that? Oh yeah, I mean absolutely. I mean I I think uh, uh, you know when Hyundai and Kia uh, decided to come off of just. Uh, basically getting their design out of art center and whatever Korean schools 
uh, hiring Peter Schreier uh, to come over there. I mean, that was a fundamental change. And they realized, and, I, and this is something I've always said, is that for most, I think most CEOs lose sight of the fact that design is a strategic weapon. And, uh, and clearly, they knew and embraced that and jumped in with both feet. And, uh, and it shows in the product. When you look at the Hyundai's of of before where they're all kind of like a miniature version of a, you know, a Lincoln town car or whatever, you, you, you know, uh, uh, the, the change was just so fundamental and the first few years were tough. And, and I have been fortunate enough to work with the motor trend guys as part of the car year stuff. And so you get a chance to line up all those things that, that are being submitted for car of the year award. And in some years there might've been 50 or 60 cars that would come into the, candidate field and obviously various models of some of them but but uh the difference was staggering and you could you could just definitely see of going from again a follower position to being really right out in front or right up at the front and uh, even though a lot of them you know like genesis and stuff emulates you know what happens in germany uh for the most part now it's advanced to the point where you know, the BMWs look pretty much the same year after year and the Genesis really starts to progress or the Hyundais and, and Kias really start to progress. And so, uh, yeah, it's, you put your finger right on it. I mean, I think recognizing that design is basically a strategic weapon uh, is just I fundamental. Love, oh, I love that for that is the fan, that is such a fantastic phrase. And you, and you're so, I think, I think you're right. I feel like design is so under, utilized in a way I, I i think that can make all the difference in terms of market share and and, and perception i feel like often it's forgotten about i mean are, are there any is there any are there any cars modern cars or can, anything sports cars normal car that come to mind these days that that you just said oh, oh that's an amazing piece of design i'm so curious to know what you think well uh you know it's it, it's always tough to single somebody out i I, I think that I'm going to be a little evasive here, but I'll, I'll maybe bring it back. The I, I think a lot of times right now, design kind of gets into uh, uh, being enamored with what's going on in movies, or you know, like like a lot of the stuff that's coming out right now is almost like this Transformers thing, you know, where the surfaces are all these busy edges and they're uh uh it's almost like a student project to me i've looked at it you know over the years reviewing portfolios of students and stuff uh it all has sort of a sameness to it and uh uh you know without naming names uh you know some of the cars today fall into those categories like when you'd line up all of the sport utilities which are big today they're such a big part of this american market you line them all up and you and you're just looking at them, for example, from the back. I mean, it's almost impossible to tell one from the other. You know, I mean, it's just without badging, you know, all the lamp graphics, all the surfaces, all of them got a split in the seat pillar, all of them got this this thing going on. And, and I just find that it just it bugs the daylights out of me. And uh, and so, you know, the, now what Let stuff? Let me ask you another question then. Let me ask you another question, then, and that because I, 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 I sort of, I totally agree. I feel like, and, and you tell me what you think about this hypothesis, that elect because of the nature of the chassis and the drivetrain, this kind of skateboard thing that people, that manufacturers generally seem to use, it kind of opens up the car to the possibility of much more interesting design than we've ever, ever had before. Because you have to bother with radiators and grills and all the rest of it. Now, a completely different thing. And I'm hoping that we like a, an amazing kind of new era of interesting design. Tell tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I uh, I feel the same way, and I I don't think uh, that's been explored, and, and in a way, rightly so. I, I think when you know Tesla came out, which is a which is a remarkable design, by the way. Uh, you know, just uh, a lot of credit to you know that initial car i mean that's been out there a number of years right now and when you when you look at it even to this day it's still as fresh you're talking about the model s 
uh, well, Model S and all the rest of them are pretty much similar, but in terms of design and graphics, not necessarily package, but, but uh, uh, you know, and it still looks fairly contemporary. The only problem is I think people will get tired of it at some point. You're going to have to, you really have to find a way to reinvent yourself. But, but uh, the electric platform, if they'd have just started out with something, you know, just this big one box, I mean, people would have looked at it and just wouldn't have been successful at all. But something with the benefits and in the image of what they're used to is a good way to transition. But I think as we move forward, we haven't even begun to explore the packaging opportunity with the electric platform and the skateboard. And uh, and to witness, I mean, you look at Rivian, for example, you look at uh, the oh, gear just tunnel. Just to say, I walked past a, I walked past a Rivian uh, yesterday in the garage. And I think that front, the front end of that car, I think is so interesting and so original of all the electric I was uh, on their board for a while, and and uh, we did a lot of the. I'm, I'm not going to take any credit. I mean, as a board member, I had nothing to do with that. But we used to lead the reviews a lot of times, and and uh, I think it's very fresh. And you needed to have something that would be a visual differentiator to the other pickup trucks. And not that we didn't have it with package and everything else, but but uh, when you look at the frunk, the gear tunnel, uh, the invent of little uh, Easter eggs that are all over the, the vehicle. Uh, and when you see it in context with the others, even the layman is going to notice that this, this year has something completely different and uh and the execution has turned out pretty well i just hope they can get their act together on volume and stuff but and i'm no longer associated with it, so i can i can say this but but uh yeah i i i think uh you're right on and, and you pick it up right away you know i mean it, it's one of those things where i think when they finally get there with the sport utility and then whatever comes after that uh, uh we'll see some good things i'm praying for a wagon I'm a big wagon person myself. Well, there's going to be the, well, yeah, yeah. That's probably your European heritage, you know, a, a <laughs> shooting break. I or think you're right. Well, yeah. you, well, yeah, well, a shooting break would be glorious, of course. Yeah. Well, weren't you, speaking of wagons, didn't you have a hand in the Magnum as well? Was that you yeah. also, if I'm wrong? Uh, well, the, the, I, I was uh, leading the charge and at the time I had taken over. Uh, advanced engineering and then later engineering and and uh uh i desperately wanted a rear wheel drive package because front wheel drive when you look at the long front overhangs and you know and like the europeans never gave up on rear wheel drive and and uh, uh and the package is is just it's iconic for a sedan and uh uh so it, we had just finished up the packaging and finished up the 300, the production car 300 on the LX platform, and, which is the rear wheel drive car. And that was a fight to get there because even the chairman wanted, you know, our, our, our chairman after Lee uh, thought, you know, well, it should be front wheel drive. And, and so I had to build cars and we went out and did the research to prove that the, the, the actual margin you could derive from a rear wheel drive car was thousands of dollars higher than a front wheel drive car. And, and, uh, so that led to doing that, that 300 and Magnum, uh, platform charger and Magnum I, platform. I those two, are, are, I love those two as, as design exercises. I just thought they were so interesting. Um, and I thought particularly with the 300, um, I thought that was a design that was punching far above its weight. Absolutely, the in, in terms of presence and 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 balance and all the rest of it. That may have been the only good thing that came out of the Daimler merger. The the that enabled me to get the E class, basically front and rear suspension, to get a transmission that we didn't have, uh, and so uh, that enabled us to do some things. And the secret of that car, and next time you look at one, just take a notice. But that car is very tall. And that enabled the packaging to be as tidy on the overhangs as it was. So it broke out of this whole uh, imagery of what sedans had become in the U.S. Because front-wheel drive, you meant you had another four, five, six inches on the front end because 
you had the transaxle and the engine there and to get crash, you had to keep adding front overhang and, and, uh, and so it gave you a kind of an unusual proportion and, and the 300 didn't have to do that uh, because now you've got the ability to manage crash. You've got the ability to, to manage the energy in a far better way. And, and so it changed the, the proportion, but the car is very tall. And those cars are basically 56, 57 inches tall. But how do you offset that? How do you get it to look like it's kind of romantic? Well, we almost made it look like it had a chop roof by raising the belt right. line. And and on the Magnum, it was magic, and the Magnum wagon especially. That today, those are becoming an icon. Sorry. When I was when I was referring to the Magnum, I was talking about the wagon. I mean, yeah. both the Magnum wagon and the 300 had this glorious kind of gun, but this kind of bunker. Uh, yeah. glass house situation happening that just made it look kind of mean and muscular and i just thought they were yeah i thought it was and and that was kind of picked up with the whole gangster look you know uh you know so yeah I, and you know it comes back to uh, caricatures in, in a way doesn't it? you know i mean almost uh the most successful things are probably uh a strong caricature in a way I think you're well. I think you're right, but I think look like anything. You know, the trick with caricatures is you don't want to be too cartoony. It's it's yeah. you know it's it's having the right amount of salt in the soup, so it tastes good, but doesn't taste too salty. <laughs> yeah. So true. And finally, oh, thank first of all, Tom. Again, I mean, it's been it's been such a joy, man, talking to you. I, I would just love to talk to you briefly. I'm very interested in your hot rod. Going back to that thing, I I truly believe the hot rod culture is 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 like jazz it's this it's this kind of free form a counterculture expression uh but made you know in, in automotive form so i'm curious to know are you are you building a hot rod now or is there one gathering dust in the garage oh yeah i've got uh i've got a couple of hot rods but everything i have is kind of a hot rod i uh i admire a lot of things like i've been a porsche fanatic for years but but my Porsche is a 356 coupe because that's the essence of Porsche, but it's a hot rod. So it's it's got a hot 912 motor. It's got a skirmish transmission. It's got... Is this an Emory special or, or did you do it yourself? Uh, I I had been... I had one uh, in the 80s. I couldn't announce it too much when I was working at Chrysler, but but I always loved that little car. And, and, uh, and so... There were a couple of guys that were just Porsche fanatics and part of the Motor City group, and they had built a couple of cars, and I'd been tracking them for years. Well, finally, one of them came up for sale, and that's the one I own now. But, but so it's a hot rod, and uh, and then I've got a an aluminum body thirty three Ford, where we is actually it, built. Is it, is it is it is it a split window in the three fifty six, or is it a, a slightly later one? I, I've always loved the split oh, window no. three fifty six. This is a three fifty six A because I the one I really like is the that that iteration i mean there were the pre-a cars that were very early bent window and they're very nice but but this one is the one that's got the soft form it's got the one-piece windshield it's got the single grill in the back the, uh, front do you remove the front and rear bumper no but they're carrera bumpers uh they're gt bumpers with the single strip with no overriders and and uh, the louver deck lid like the gt's had and the Stinger exhaust. What what color is it? It's silver with a red stripe, and then it's got the Speedster buckets and a Nardi wheel, and so it's a uh, it's a hot rod. Fantastic! That yeah. sounds fantastic. What else is in the What else is in the garage? Well, my thirty three uh, Roadster Ford Roadster uh, has a supercharged uh, Chrysler five nine V eight, but it's all aluminum body, and so. It, we made a wood buck and reshaped it. It's got a lot of similarity to uh, Prowler because I was building it about the same time. And then I've got a a 32 Ford uh, Roadster with uh, a vintage Dodge uh, D500 Hemi uh, and a five-speed and a quick-change rear. And it's all done old school, Halibrand wheels. and uh, uh, But it's just... It's it's. Do you have the skull? Uh, the skull no, <laughs> no, <disease>. no. It's <laughs> it's got a a, a, a tree mech five speed knob, but uh, no, it's uh, 
it's very much uh, romantic. It's got kind of a it's Italian spinny back leather inside, but it's kind of a bomber jacket color, you know, um, oh, which would have yeah, been yeah, yeah. 50s, 60s vibe thing. Uh, so you're, it's you're a bit of a romantic, aren't you, Tom? Oh yeah. And then I've got a one of the first cars I worked on at uh, Chrysler was when I was engineering was a seventy E body Barracuda Challenger, and uh, uh, so I always wanted an AAR Cuda, and I've had that for years since the eighties. So I've, it's AAR Cuda is the is the car the production version of the car that was homologated for Trans Am racing. And uh, so it was back. It was a factory hot rod as well. It's uh, 346 back, uh, crazy stripes, bigger tires in the back than the front, side ex exhausts, uh, uh, but uh, fun. It's fun. And a couple of Vipers I have and a Prowler. And, and uh, of course, you got to have a Hellcat. So I got a Hellcat. <laughs> well, that sounds like a pretty, uh, that sounds like a pretty hooligan garage. I have yeah. to say, I've never actually owned an American car. We got to get you going. <laughs> Come <laughs> on, on. <laughs> what would you? What would you? What would you recommend, Tom? As a, well, you know what? I actually, I really love. I, I was in, in race spec, in race livery. Uh, I always found um, the AMC Javelin. I just, yeah. That with that with that kind of that race that way it looked I just, from, and i'm a mechanical village idiot so i know i know nothing about how things work but i just always thought that looks cool to me and i don't see them around much that was a wonderful era you know kind of the end of the dick teague era at, at amc and interestingly enough one of the designers who runs the jeep studio right now uh has redone a javelin uh where he's sectioned it uh it is so snarky i mean it's a hot rod and Mark Allen, he's just a, an amazing talent, and uh, he's got one that you would die for. He, it's, uh, oh, it. it's just crazy. So we'll have to get you a photo of that. Well, look, I, I just, but I guess that that draws it all to a conclusion. But I just want to say again, Tom, it's been a real privilege to talk to you, man. It's been such a delight, yeah. and and so interesting to hear, like you know, because I've, I've I've seen like I'm just a regular civilian, so all these cars have been discussing, and all these people have been discussing. I have no, it, it's amazing to hear your stories of the cars and of the people. But I just want to say thank you again for coming on the, the show, on the podcast. It's been a real privilege. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for uh, celebrating the automobiles that uh, a lot of us are so passionate about. So thank you. Thanks again, John. Take yeah. care of yourself. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye.